thanks, Daniel, and, um, and welcome to everyone. It's, um, it's fantastic to have a, uh, such a big crowd here. Um, my name is Peter Issam. I'm the analytical head of uh, Standard & Poor's structured finance team in Asia-Pacific, excluding Japan. Um, there's a range of other people from S&P here. Uh, notably, most of you know Fabian Michaud in the front row here. Um, and it's my pleasure to welcome Karen and Carlo, uh, who are visiting with us in the region from, um, from Europe. Um, Karen Naylor is the, um, the global head of Covered Bonds for S&P, based in London. And Carlo Fuchs, to her left, is the analytical manager for Covered Bonds, based in Frankfurt. Um, Karen, Carlo and I have sort of, this is the last day of a two-week odyssey around Asia-Pacific. Um, I think we're all shockingly exhausted, so if you want to have a go at us today, today's the day, because we're weak and tired. Um, we've been through uh, Hong Kong, Korea, Singapore, China, Melbourne and here over the last um, ten days or so. Predominantly visiting with um, investors, uh, intermediaries, regulators, and some issuers um, to really talk about covered bonds. And covered bonds have sort of got an awful lot of prominence globally, and in particular here in Australia, I guess, in, in recent weeks and months. And you know, we've sort of seen the covered bond product as a whole move from being a European, well, predominantly a European um, asset class, to something that's now being looked at globally and being used globally by a range of issuers. You know, we've seen covered bonds from Canadian issuers come down here to Australia. French issuers have come down, to, come down and tapped the Australian market. We've got the, um, the exposure draft out in the market at the moment in terms of how covered bonds will be, will be set up in Australia. Um, and it's a market that I think, Carlo, is at sort of 2.4 trillion and growing. And we're expecting it to keep on growing fairly strongly, particularly as we bring new markets and, and new jurisdictions online. So um, you know, what we wanted to try and cover today is really a, a bit of an overview of what covered bonds are and um, how we analyse covered bonds. And then we'll really try and sort of bring that into an Australian context, because I'm sure all of you are basically saying, what's this all going to mean for Australia? So we'll really try and dig into how our criteria can be interpreted in the Australian market and what we think is actually going to happen in the context of Australia. Um, just for those of you, um, I guess, as we've met with people around the, around the markets, there's been a range of different sort of knowledge levels in terms of what covered bonds are and how they work. So I'm just going to quickly take a couple of minutes just to give a covered bond 101 for those of you that may need it. A covered bond is a, a debt instrument that is issued by a bank and usually is, well, issued by a bank and is backed by a portfolio of collateral of some sort. So it's almost like a secured um, bank debt instrument. Um, typically the cover pool, which are the assets that are, are segregated or siloed for the benefit of note holders, typically are very high credit quality assets, so they're usually uh, amongst the best sort of parts of a bank's portfolio. And they're really there to be able to um, support the, the notes that have been issued by the bank in the event that the bank has, um, gets into distress or goes insolvent. So the cover pool sits in a separate SPV. The bank issues the bond, and the bank is responsible for all payments associated with the covered bond, so all interest and all bullet maturities, um, on each and every interest payment date, and also responsible for repayment on the bullet maturity dates. In the event that the bank is unable to do so, that's where the cover pool comes into, comes into the picture. So the cover pool is almost like a contingent security that's sitting there in the event that note holders ever need it. Um, I guess the investor base for, for covered bonds has, um, is very well established in Europe and predominantly it tends to be rates investors in Europe that look at this product. And I guess they're sort of, they tend to look at it as an extremely high credit quality product. But one of the things that we've seen as we've gone around the, um, around the globe over the last few weeks, and Karen and Carla were also in the US three or four weeks ago as well, is that the investors are starting to, particularly the global investors, are starting to look at this product a little bit more closely and starting to really try and scratch the surface a bit in terms of understanding how it works, how the cover pool works, and what is the instrument that they're actually, they're actually buying. If you think about covered bonds, you know, once a bank has established a covered bond program, it will typically have a range of maturities that they will, they will put in place. And these can be three, five, ten, I think, Carlo, even up to 50-year maturities. And it takes time for a bank to sort of develop that, that maturity profile. And, and over time, you start to get to a position where your assets and liabilities and how they match off start to sort of sit reasonably well within a cover, a cover pool. In terms of you tend to have long-dated assets, typically residential mortgages or public sector bonds and loans. And you know, trying to manage this asset liability mismatch and, and how that uh, interacts with, with BAL3 is something that you know, covered bonds, we've found, have been a fairly useful instrument, but it takes time to sort of get to that point where you've, you're starting to develop this, um, this match. I guess there's a couple of messages that we want to be able to get out there, and you'll, you'll hear it progressively over the course of the session today. It's really around the asset liability mismatch is one of the big areas that we focus on. 
you know, covered bonds in the event that the bank itself was to fall over has a bullet maturity. And you typically have 30-year residential mortgage loans, but you might have a five-year maturity or a three-year maturity on your covered bond or a 10-year maturity. And that mismatch between the assets, which are long dated, and each individual maturity creates an obligation for the bank to be able to meet that maturity if they can do so, but if they can't, there is potentially a market value risk in terms of needing to liquidate some of the cover pool in order to be able to meet that, meet that maturity that's coming up. And that's one of the areas that we're going to focus on a lot when we get Karen shortly to go through the criteria, is really around the asset liability mismatch and the market value risk potentially that is in some of these transactions. And it's a, it's a big area of focus for us, and, and Karen will show you a slide um, shortly, which sort of looks at you know the, the com components of over collateralisation that we would typically see in a in a covered bond transaction, and you know from our perspective, probably the biggest risk in a covered bond actually relates to market value, and so we sort of at pains to emphasise to investors to, to make sure that they really understand what the components are. Um, I think with that. Um, I'll turn it over to Karen. So just before I do that, it's a couple of things. Um, we'll go th Once Karen's gone through the criteria, and the criteria is a global criteria, so it's applied to covered bond issuers everywhere around the world, we'll try and bring that back so that people can understand broadly where it's going to sit in Australia. Um, we can't tell you how we're going to, like, what the rating is going to be on a covered bond and what the overcollateralisation level is because we don't know. Um, we have to wait and see what the legislative framework looks like. We have to see what the cover pool looks like and what the transaction structure and documentation looks like before we can actually form that opinion. But we'll broadly try and give you an idea of what we think is likely to happen. Okay, Karen, over to you.